Welcome back to Intro Psychology. Now we're ready to talk about the analysis we use in psychological research. It's important to note that the analysis in psychological research can be either qualitative, quantitative, or a mix of both. By qualitative analysis, we're talking about how we analyze uh, interviews, long texts, and case studies. This is often through taking quotes or taking scenarios, looking at the content for themes, uh, and it's done through uh, things like the software program in vivo. Then there's also quantitative analysis. This is when we're not in so much interested in long quotes, but we're interested in checkboxes and numbers. So when we measure things like reaction time or number of collisions or how people rated themselves on a scale, then we look at the numbers across a large number of participants and look at the statistics. For the purpose of this lecture today, we're going to focus more on quantitative analysis, but please keep in mind that qualitative analysis is an important part of analysis in psychology. And so for quantitative analysis, quantitative statistics, we tend to look at two schools of statistics. There's descriptive and inferential. Descriptive statistics is where we just describe the data of our sample, the people who participated in our study. So we merely just describe uh, what, they, what they scored, who was the highest score, who was the lowest score, what was the average score, and what have you. Then with inferential statistics, we actually take the numbers in our sample and we try to use the sample to explain things about the population. Do we think this is predictive of the population? Do we think this is rare? Do we think that the, that the IV predicted the DV? And so first we're going to talk about descriptive and then we'll talk about inferential statistics. So with descriptive statistics, again, this is to describe the numbers you have in your sample and you don't make guesses about a population. And two of the main things we use in descriptive statistics are distributions and associations. A distribution shown on the left with the bell curve is the idea that we're looking at one variable. Imagine we measured reaction time in a sample of 100 people. We might find some people score uh, very low, they have a slow reaction time, and some people score really fast, uh, and some people are in the middle. We would actually find most people are in the middle on most human characteristics. And so what we'd find, um, what is plotted over there is on the well, uh, x-axis or the horizon, that is the reaction time. And what is on the vertical axis or the y-axis, that's the number of people who scored that way. So when the curve is very low, few people scored on the tail ends of the curve. And when the curve becomes very high, this shows a large number of people scored in the middle on our measure of reaction time. Now what we do with that measure of, of uh, the distribution is we can look at two things, central tendency and variance. So central tendency tells us where the center of our curve is. And in most human characteristics, the center of the curve uh, is in the very center. It's a, it's a symmetrical curve. Sometimes it's not though. And when it's not, we can tease this apart and start to look at three measures of central tendency. Those are the mean, the median, and the mode. The mean is the mathematical average. So this is if you, t if you add up everyone's reaction time and divide by the number of participants, we have the average reaction time or the mean. The median is the middle score. This is when you line up everyone's reaction time from slowest to fastest and you count which score is in the absolute middle. That is 50% of participants were slower and 50% of participants were faster who scored in the middle. Sometimes the median is the same as the mean, but in other cases it's not. And finally, we have the mode. The mode is the most common or prevalent score. So what is the most frequent score? And so this is the most popular score. And again, in a curve that we would call normal, our mean, median, and mode are identical. But in the curve I have here, for example, they're not. So this curve is actually showing the percentage of students who complete their homework at different schools uh, in a different school division. And we can see in the mode, the most prominent score, is that in a lot of schools, 100% of the students have their homework done. So that's the most commonplace score. We can also find that the average, the mean, is lower down and closer to the tail than the median. And that's because the mean is an average score. It is influenced by extreme scores. So if there's one school out there that only 20% of students have their homework done, and you add up all the scores and add up all the schools and divide by the number of schools, that's going to drag the mathematical average or the mean towards the tail or towards the extreme scores. 
For instance, the median is just showing 50% of scores on one side, 50% of scores on the other side. So in this picture, if you actually count the dots, the column where the median is pointing will contain the dot that has 50% of scores above and 50% of scores below. So again, when the mean, median, mode are all the same, we have a special type of curve that has special mathematical properties. This is called a normal curve or a normal distribution. And as mentioned, almost all human characteristics, if measured a certain way, are normally distributed. And so the center curve here with just the one light colored line, that is showing a normal curve. And in a normal curve, the mathematical average is in the center. And that's because it's a symmetrical curve and all the cases above the line and below the line cancel each other out. The median is also in the center. That's showing 50% of, of cases are above the line and below the line. It's the middle score. And because this shows the peak in the curve, that's also telling us where the most commonplace score is. And that is why the mode is also in the middle. However, sometimes in psychology, we have curves that are not normal. Sometimes we have curves that are positively skewed or negatively skewed. And to not mix these up, this is the way I think about it. If you think about a number line, a line of integers, uh, and it's in your visual space, uh, what happens is the negative numbers are more towards your left and the positive numbers are more towards your right. And so a negatively skewed curve has its tail pointed towards the negative end of the number line. So it's pointed to your left. When the positive curve, a positively skewed curve has its tail pointed towards the positive end of the number side, so pointed towards your right. So we look at these images, the curve on the left has a tail pointing left or towards the negative end of a number line, and that is a negatively skewed curve. In a negatively skewed curve, what we find is the mean, the, the light colored vertical line, has pulled towards the tail. The mean always pulls towards the tail or towards the influence, influential scores. The mode, which is the most popular score, is where it's the grayish line and it's where the curve is the tallest. And the median is similar to the mode, but it has pulled away too because it's where there's 50% of cases. We can also see the positively skewed curve, which is on the right side of the chart, and its tail is pointed towards the right or the more positive end of the number line. Again, this is just a symmetrical flip. We can see the mean has now moved more towards the tail, whereas the mode and median have moved less. If you're working with skewed curves, it's important to realize that a measure of central tendency uh, that better describes your curve may be your mode or median and not your mean. And that's because the mean is highly influenced. Whereas when we have a normally distributed curve, either one of these is going to be fine because they're going to be essentially interchangeable. Now, aside from looking at uh, just what central tendency is, we're going to look at calculated central tendency. So don't want to scare anybody with the formula, but this is how we think about calculating average in psychology. So X means uh, the, the different scores on a variable. X bar refers to the average. Uh, e, that, that E is actually a sigma, and that means adding them all up or summing them all up. And N means the number of cases. So if we were to uh, calculate the average, and we measured something and the scores were 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, we want to calculate the average. First thing we do is we sum up all the scores. So sigma x means summing up all the scores. And divided by n means you divide by the number of scores. We have nine scores, so n is nine. And sigma x should be roughly 27 when we add up all the scores. Therefore, calculating the mean tells us that the average in all those scores will be 3. Now, I've already listed the scores in order. It's sometimes you'll have scores that are out of order and you have to rearrange them, putting the lowest scores first and the highest scores last. But they're already arranged, and out of our nine scores, we can see the middle score with four scores above it and four scores below it. The median, or the middle score, is three. And just by virtue of, of looking at that, looking at the mode, the most popular score out of those nine scores, there's only one one and one five. There's two twos and two fours, but there's three threes, so three is our most popular score. Now, if you take that very tiny data set and you graph it, we can see here um, in the bell curve that again, three is going to be the mean, median, and mode for this curve. So that's just an example of where these numbers are coming from. So now that we've talked about central tendency in descriptive statistics, we also need to think about variance. So what is variance? 
Central tendency tells us the middle of the curve, but variance tells us the spread or squish of the curve. That is, we know it peaks in the middle if it's a normal curve and it has tails, but how squished or spread out are those tails? The variance is really the range around the mean. How wide do scores vary? Perhaps we looked at reaction time and everyone scored within a minute to two minutes. Or perhaps we measured reaction time and everyone scored within 58 seconds and, and 60 seconds. So the range would be very different, two seconds or 60 seconds. And one of the ways we look at variance is a standardized index of variance, and that is called the standard deviation. So a standard deviation is a way that we measure uh, how much is the average uh, spread and so how do scores deviate from the mean? So the mean, remember, the mean in a normal curve is that center, and different scores will be spread or squished away from that. But on average, what's the distance of scores from, from the mean? On average, what's the distance of scores from the average? As uh, so the typical distance from the mean. So to give you an example, if we were to ask everyone how many fingers and thumbs they have, we may find our curve is either a straight line or pretty close to our straight line. That is, I would anticipate the mode and the mean and the median to be 10 digits on your hands. We may have some people with 11 or 12 or 9 or 8 or less than that. And so there would be some variance, but the variance would be relatively small. In comparison, if we asked everyone to run a marathon and we measured how long it took everyone to run a marathon, we may find that there's no one time in the marathon where a ton of people cross the line. There might be some people who can finish in three hours, and there might be some people who finish in seven hours, and we might find there's a constant stream of people and that the curve is pretty flat. Of course, the imagery on this slide became pretty common when we talked about the COVID-19 crisis and flattening the curve. So this is the idea we didn't want everyone to get COVID-19 in the same number of weeks. So in this case, we're looking at the distribution of the days and the vertical is how many cases or the frequency of new cases. And we wanted to make sure it was spread out. So we wanted to make sure the curve had more variance and the curve is measuring the dates of which people were diagnosed. And so you can see down here the more colorful curve with the orange and yellow, blue, green, red. Uh, that is showing distinct vertical intervals on the curve. And these intervals are called the standard deviations. Beyond a normal curve, there's certain mathematical properties we can assume. And we know that a standard deviation around the mean, so, so the two blue vertical lines, on a normal curve, close to 68.5% of all participants will be within one standard deviation of the mean. So they'll be within one interval below the mean and one interval above the mean. So within the two blue bars, we've captured close to 70% of, of our sample. Then we know within the green and yellow, that's two standard deviations from the mean, we know that that captures close to 95% of our sample if it is a normal curve. And then the, the orange and the red, uh, within three standard deviations of the mean, that actually captures 98.1%. And so within three standard deviations of the mean, we have nearly everyone. Knowing this mathematical property can help us to quickly assess if a case is rare or common. So for example, we know that uh, IQ has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So right away that tells us that close to 70% of people should have an IQ between 85 and 115. We also know uh, that close to 95% of people should have an IQ between 70 and 130. So then we know what the rare IQ scores are. This works for things like uh, weight of babies at birth. We know that the mean in Canada is about 7.25 pounds with a deviation, standard deviation of 1.25 pounds. So then you can use that to calculate if a baby's birth weight was atypically high or atypically low or considerably average.